Okay, final step is to go from a set of predicted gene functions to a metabolic model. By the way, notice, you probably can't read this, but there are a number of really short functions in our protein sequence lift, list. They basically say ORF, or open reading frame, which means there's a gene here, but we can't predict what its function is, and about half, of all, half the genes in all genomes, we don't know what they do. Sometimes you'll also see conserved protein. That means that, well, we can find a cousin of this protein in some other organism, but we don't know what that one does. We don't know what any of its cousins do. So we know it's found in multiple organisms, but we don't know what it does. So the next step is, is reactome inference. And the idea is that for each protein in the organism, we want to figure out what reactions it catalyzes. Um, now, not every protein in the organism is an enzyme, so roughly a quarter of the genes in E. coli code for metabolic enzymes that perform some chemical reaction in the cell. <coughs> but the idea is that for those that are enzymes, we want to figure out what chemical reaction they catalyze. And this is more or less a lookup operation in that the way we express a protein function is to give a name for that protein like ATP synthase, or to give an EC number is a num another way of expressing a protein function. It's a classification system for enzymes that assigns unique numbers to different enzymes. And so we developed a program that looks up enzyme names and EC numbers in our MetaPsych database, which is a metabolic enzyme and reaction database. And whenever we find a match, we basically import the chemical reaction from MetaPsych into the database that we're building for this new genome that we're analyzing. In some cases, when we have the time and the funding, we'll also do some manual examination of the enzyme names that couldn't be matched automatically by our program and yield some added value there because the program doesn't get all of these right. Uh, well, what is the MetaPsych database? Well, it's, it's a carefully curated database where we've spent a good 15 years curating about 33,000 different articles and pulling out chemical metabolic reactions and enzyme information and small, small chemical compounds and metabolic pathways into this database. We now have about 10,000 different reactions in the database, about 1,800 metabolic pathways. And the, basically, the bigger this database is, the more accurately we can predict reactions and pathways in the genomes that we sequence, genomes that we analyze. MetaPsych actually has a number of applications. It's a general encyclopedic reference source on metabolic pathways that's available through the web. It's used to predict metabolic pathways from genomes. It can be used for metabolic engineering if you want to find new reactions to insert into E. coli to help it make a biofuel. MetaPsych is a good place to go for finding a, a library of possible reactions. So here's another depiction of what our pathway tool software does. Again, the input is an annotated genome sequence. It's, a set, it's the sequence plus the list of genes and their locations plus the predicted functions of the gene products. And then our MetaPsych database is a source of reactions and compounds and pathways. And what Pathologic does is to match the enzymes against the, react the enzymes and reactions in MetaPsych and kind of pull out the subset of reactions and pathways in MetaPsych that apply to this organism and create a new database that couples the genome information with the pathway information from MetaPsych. And we've essentially performed that kind of analysis now for 1,900 different genomes to create our BioPsych collection of databases, which we're updating on a fairly regular basis. And it combines a set of these pathway genome databases, where most of them have been purely computationally derived. But for some, we've had the time and money to do curation on them, to make them more accurate by adding in information from the experimental literature, to try to correct the computational predictions where possible, and, and add the kind of commentary and literature citations that I showed you earlier from the literature, as well as adding information that you just can't predict computationally. There's lots of information about the biology of these organisms that bioinformatics can't even approach yet. And so in particular, 
we've curated the MetaPsych database, the EcoPsych E. coli database, a human database. Stanford's created a yeast database, and another group at the Carnegie Institution has created a curated database for the plant Arabidopsis, which is a, a highly studied plant that was the first plant to have its genome sequenced. And the computational processing pipeline that we use is to predict the reactome, to predict the metabolic pathways. We also have predictors for which genes code for missing enzymes in the metabolic pathways. The metabolic pathways often have holes in them where we, there's no gene pre that's been identified in the organism to code for a given reaction in the pathway. And we regenerate this set on a regular basis, and it usually takes roughly a week of processing time on about 300 uh, processors here at SRI to process these 2,000 genomes. And we've, we've tried to create a lot of visualization tools to help biologists uh, comprehend the very complex information space that's available for each organism. So as well as the interactive genome browser that I showed you, we can have, we have computer-generated genome posters. We have computer-generated metabolic charts for the organism that show the full set of uh, metabolic pathways and reactions present in the organism. And we have an online version of this diagram as well that we call the cellular overview. So this is a, a diagram that shows the full metabolic map of E. coli. This is purely computer generated. And so for each of the 2,000 organisms in BioPsych, we can generate a metabolic map poster for it that shows its individual set of metabolic pathways. This, this diagram is zoomable, so we can, just like Google Maps, uh, zoom in on different regions, and eventually we'll get the names of every metabolite and the names of different genes and enzymes, and we can move around in this diagram. We can search the diagram to find different things. And another thing we can do is to use that diagram for data analysis. So another reason to create these pathway genome databases is you can use these databases to help analyze the high throughput data sets that biologists are generating. So let's say you just generated, you just did a gene expression experiment for E. coli, and you now have 4,600 numbers that give an expression level for each E. coli gene. Um, how do you think it would feel to go through a list of 4,600 numbers and figure out what's going on in the cell? Well, one way to simplify that process is to color the different reactions in our metabolic chart with colors that indicate the expression levels of those genes so that you can see which parts of the cell's biochemical machinery are turned up and which parts are turned down and maybe click on one of these reactions to see a time course uh, graph of how the expression of that gene is changing over time because often these expression measurements are done uh, at several different points in time. So we've provided a data analysis platform as well. So the final step in creating a metabolic model is to use a method called flux balance analysis. So what we've, what we've obtained to date using the analysis I've told you about is we now have a metabolic reaction list for our organism. We have a list of all the reactions that the enzyme in that organism catalyze. And this method called flux balance analysis can create steady state models of, of the metabolic pathways of the cell. They're steady state in the sense that we're assuming the cell is kind of like a car running on the freeway at 60 miles an hour. It's, it's going somewhere, but its state isn't changing. Okay, this, the, the car's speed is fixed. Similarly, when the cell is at a steady state, these reactions are processing material, but at a fixed rate. Okay, and so to build these, so, so the real breakthrough in this methodology for creating mo models is that in the past to create quantitative cellular models, the approaches people would use would require many different numeric parameters for each reaction. 
You need to know different rate constants for each enzyme in the cell. You need to know the concentrations of different <clears throat> metabolites in the cell. And there were so many parameters that you couldn't possibly measure them all. So the modeling was kind of hopeless. But using this technique, first of all, because you're, using a, you're creating a steady state model rather than a kinetic model that explains how the organism, how the network changes over time, that's, that's one part of the simplification. But what you need to create these models are, first of all, the metabolic reaction list. Second of all, you need a list of the nutrients that the cell is growing under. And usually you constrain the uptake rate of one of those nutrients. So you tell it glucose is available, but the most glucose you can use is so many uh, moles per, per second. You then also need to specify biomass components of the organism. So the cell's metabolic machinery is making end products that the cell is putting into its own biomass. So the amino acids, the DNA components, the cell membrane components. And what people do is to measure the relative mass ratios of these biomass components. And you also need to know any other outputs of the metabolic network. Uh, life creates waste products, like uh, we and E. coli both breathe out CO2, for example. And so we need to know the relative masses of CO2 and, and other biomass components. And the way flux balance analysis works is because of this steady state assumption, steady state means that the concentrations of all of these metabolites are fixed. So A is being taken up at a fixed rate and being converted to B and C, et cetera, but the levels of these metabolites are not changing. A is being taken up from the environment and X and net X and Y are being produced, but all the interior metabolites are not changing. And if that's true, it means that all the reactions that produce a given metabolite balance all the reactions that consume that metabolite, which means that we can write a linear equation that says R1 plus R2, meaning the rates of those reactions, equals R3 plus R4 plus R5. And so for each metabolite in the system, we write one of these equations. We then get a list of linear equations, and we submit them to a linear optimization package. And what we tell the linear optimizer is to optimize biomass production, for example. We tell it to optimize the rate at which X and Y are produced, and to find assignments of fluxes to each reaction that optimizes the production of X and Y. And that's what linear solvers do. And so the results of this calculation are steady state assignments of reaction fluxes to the metabolic network. And it turns out that by, by doing this optimization, uh, it turn, apparently cells are close to optimal because when people have experimentally checked the flux rates that are predicted with this optimization approach, they work out quite closely to what's observed experimentally. And there are other ways to validate these models as well, like the knockout approach. You can simulate the knockout of each one of these genes, rerun your model, and then compare the results of that simulation to experiments where people have knocked out the genes. Believe it or not, people have generated E. coli's with every possible single gene knockout and then characterized them uh, experimentally. That's 4,000 some strains of E. coli. And so our approach is to generate these models using programs from our pathway genome databases. So essentially we store the metabolic model within a database, a pathway genome database within our pathway tool software. That means that all the query and visualization tools that I just showed you can be applied to inspect your model and understand your model and to edit and update your model. <clears throat> and we have a program called Metaflux that generates a linear programming problem generates those reactions, sorry, those linear equations from the reactions in our pathway database. And then Metaflux automatically submits the set of equations to a constraint solver and interprets the result file. Now, the problem is, um, in the past, it would take people a year or two to build these models. 
because number one, it would take people a long time to come up with the metabolic reaction list. Often they do it manually. <coughs> but number two, when they press that button and sent that on the linear solver that says solve my model, they'd get all zeros as the result because their models were incomplete, because there are gaps, because as I said, half of the genes in a genome have no predicted functions, so you're missing enzymes. So um, imagine that you're missing this reaction. Well, there's no path from A to X, so your model can't be solvable. There's no way to create any X out of A if you don't have a path in your network from A to X. And in E. coli, we have 46 different biomass components. So imagine a network of 1,000 reactions. You're trying to produce 46 different biomass components from roughly a dozen input nutrients, and a single missing reaction could make your model not solve. And in fact, you might have 20 or 50 missing reactions. So that's why it would take people a year or two uh, to build these models and get them to work. It's a very painstaking process. So um, there was a publication a couple years ago by a group at Penn State where they developed the notion of reaction gap filling where they, they realize there are several kinds of problems that these models have. Uh, they might have missing reactions, or reactions might be written in the wrong direction because the reactions sometimes go in one direction, sometimes the other direction. And so the approach they, they formulated was to take a database like MetaPsych and have a program that would try adding different sets of reactions from MetaPsych into from a metabolic reaction database into the metabolic model to, to render it solvable. Okay, so you essentially define a meta-optimization program problem that says, find me a minimal number, a minimal cost set of reactions to add from an external database into my database that will render my model solvable. And that actually works. Um, now we've actually extended their technique a bit because it's not only reactions you might want to gap fill, but you might have missing nutrients or missing secretions. And actually, if you had a single missing secretion, secreted waste product, that could cause your model to not solve. And even after all that gap filling, there's no guarantee that your model's going to solve. So another thing that our software does is um, it identifies partial solutions. It tells you, well, I can make 40 of your 46 biomass components, but here are the 46 that I can't make. Uh, that's where you need to focus the rest of your energies, and that's a huge help to be told uh, where to do the rest of your exploration. And so here's the objective function that we define for the multiple gap filling, where we kind of define a cost function that, that we want to minimize to essentially do a, a minimal number of changes to our model to make it solvable. And we've, we've developed two of these models, one for human metabolism, one for E. coli metabolism, Actually, it's the human model that has 46 biomass components and 13 nutrients. And when you solve it, you need 207 reactions to create the 46 biomass components from the 13 nutrients. And um, the gap filler was needed for our human model. It, the gap filler suggested adding eight new reactions to MetaPsych. And when we researched them, we found that there was actually evidence in the literature to support four of those additions. So they were actually known. We had never found those when we created our human database, found those articles. And also it suggested reversing, well, four or more reactions. Anyway, four of them were confirmed by our literature searches. We found that the gap filler is not perfect. Some of its suggestions are wrong, but um, it does get you to a, a model that works, even if it works sometimes for the wrong reasons. And here's a, we, we can also use our metabolic map diagram to analyze the results of these flux calculations, where here we're coloring the reactions in the metabolic chart with colors that indicate their flux levels, so that we can see that the green pathway is an intermediate level of flux, and the yellow ones are a low level, et cetera. And here's our description of our E. coli model. Uh, we have a few more biomass components. These are the input nutrients to E. coli. These are the outputs. And in this case, 372 reactions are carrying flux. That's not to say that E. coli has more complicated metabolism than humans. It's more that the human model is a bit incomplete right now. And we've 
validated the model in two ways. We've checked its predictions against 383 different known experimental growth conditions for E. coli and found 72% accuracy. And we've also simulated many gene knockouts and compared that to experimental results and found 91% accuracy. And this is higher than the 60% accuracy that I talked about earlier on because the 60% number was for purely computationally generated models that hadn't been hand-tuned, whereas we've done a lot of hand-tuning on the model, uh, and so we can improve its accuracy. And so I will stop there. Thanks for your attention. Happy to take questions.